and welcome to another episode of Teaching with Inquiry Live. It is Monday night and it is November, so we are continuing our discussion more on assessment. So tonight in particular, we are going to talk about the different types of assessments that you can use in your classroom. And I'm going to walk you through some of the forms and tools that I use to track student data on the fly, as well as both the formative and summative assessments that are happening in my classroom. So I'm going to walk you through some of those tools. your first time joining us thank you so much for joining me my name is patty i'm a junior grade teacher here in ontario canada and i come live every single monday night to talk about using all the different strategies while you're using inquiry-based learning in your classroom i'm also the teacher blogger behind madlylearning.com and i am madly learning on all of your social media platforms and you can find me there as well so let's dig in right away. And hello to all of you that are joining me. So we are going to talk about all the different assessment tools. So we can break it up into really two different assessment types of tools, or at least these are the ones that I'm using. And I wanna make sure that I'm just talking about the things that I'm using in my classroom. And if you're using something different, I would love to know what assessment looks like in your classroom. So feel free to pop that in the comments at any point in time during tonight's broadcast. Because if there's something new I can learn, I'm definitely interested in learning more about it. So I want you to think about this. What is your number one go-to assessment tool? How are you collecting assessment on a regular basis in your classroom? So what is it? What does it look like? Pop that in the comments right now and share what your number one assessment tool is. And I'm going to share with you what mine is by the end of tonight's broadcast. So there are two different versions that I look at, two different categories of assessment. The first are your tried and true paper assessment tools. And then there's also digital assessment tools if you're trying to go a little bit more paperless. Now, when it comes to paper assessment tools, I like using a variety of different paper assessment tools that I can use interchangeably in my classroom. And I use them for a variety of reasons. Now, I often will have these printed and prepped and planned out beforehand, which means that I have about six different paper assessment tools that I have ready to go at any point in time so that I can grab those and use them whenever I need it. So I'm going to walk you through the different types of assessment tools that I have on paper that I use regularly as well as how to use them. So the first one is this orange one. So this is what I'm calling kind of like my class list checklist. Now, this is simply just my checklist that I am going to use with my students. And I will have, it's what is most often in my assessment book. I put their student numbers go down here, as well as their names will go down here. Now, obviously this is blank because I'm not going to share my student names with you. But on the top here are going to be the categories. Now, I will use these for look for lists where I'm simply just wanting a target expectation that I'm trying to look for in that lesson or in that piece of work that I'm collecting. So can they demonstrate a knowledge and understanding skill? And I will put that skill at the top in one of the columns and simply as I'm collecting student work or whether I'm walking around circulating with students, I will use often a symbol or a letter or even a number to signify where they are on the continuum of learning. So I really kind of look at learning as a continuum from where I want them to be is they get the concept to they have an advanced level of understanding of the concept. So they're extending versus approaching. And if they're really not getting it, then there's a category for that too. So I will use a variety of notations to indicate that. But really it comes down to, are they at standard, which is a B, or it's a happy face, or it's simply a check mark. If they're exceeding, I will give two check marks, or perhaps a surprised face, or even I will give an A or a level four. 
And if they're approaching and they're getting it, they're just a little bit off, they're not quite there yet, but they're going to get it, then that would be a level two or a C, or it's sometimes I will just note, note it with a straight line instead of a check mark. And then if somebody who's really struggling and they're just not getting it, then that would be an X, a D, a level one, or a sad face. I will also color code those with red, orange, uh, yellow, green, or red, orange, blue, green. It really changes, but they all kind of fit at that same continuum with where students are. And that is, are they at grade level? Are they approaching grade level? Or are they exceeding? And that's really where I'm looking at. And I will change the notation, really depending on what I happen to be feeling that day as I'm feeling out the chart. But for me, they all really mean the same things. So it will change page to page, day to day, week to week. But I will go through these because especially if I'm looking for a, a variety of skills along this thing I'm evaluating, then I will want multiple places to put that in there. So that is kind of my look for list or just my standard class list that I think we've probably already seen. And most of us are probably using it. Now, the second thing that I'm also using is I will use the very similar thing, except sometimes there's a reason. There we go. Sometimes there's a reason why we would want to make notes. So again, I have my student numbers and their names will go here. And then I have some space here. Now, sometimes I will make a column with a ruler down here, but then I have room for notes. There's a lot of times where if I just have one simple box to put a code, that doesn't really give me enough information. Sometimes I want to be able to expand on that code that I wrote down and be able to explain it and kind of make notes for myself. Now, often all of these assessment pages are assessment pages that I am using and keeping for my own records. They're not yet the pieces that I'm communicating with students or sharing with them the results of my assessment. These are really my assessment tools of how I'm tracking my data. There are instances where I'm working with a student on reading or even in math where I need a little bit more than simply just a code. Perhaps a student is approaching grade level because they're making multiple little errors along the way and they just haven't solidly demonstrated that they understand it. But for that student, I might not be as worried. They might just need more time. Versus another student who is really good at one concept, but really poor at another concept. So they might both get approaching grade level because they're not yet showing mastery of all of the skills. But for the one student that's really struggling with one concept versus the student who gets the same code on my assessment book, but perhaps they are just making small errors, but it's just a matter of time before they get it. I need some place to note that. So I will often use what I will call my checklist with a notes line to just write a quick note on what my students are doing. So I have, those are my first two. So again, I have a lot of different variations of this class list that I can use. And the reason I have this is because it allows me to be a bit more flexible. Now, in the same token, sometimes I don't need a whole page to do assessment. So because of that, I will often make those checklist pages and I will do a half page. So I end up photocopying these. I cut them down in the middle. And these are just a quick, yes, they handed it in. Um, maybe they handed in a second thing. And then I'll give them their, the mark that I recorded for there. Now, these are kind of my on the fly papers because they won't fit in my plan book. So I will often take this kind of hand in checklist and then I will transpose that into my actual mark book on another type of page. But this is the one that's kind of quick and easy to just have on hand at all times for all of those times where you find you need a class list, but you don't need a whole page to do it. So I have those. So that's the first three different types of checklists and assessment lists that I have. Now, another one that I find really important is oh, this one here. Sometimes there are times where you need a larger space to be recording the information on your students. This is one where I will have, it'll be front and back. My whole class will fit on either half a page, so I'll put 
half my class on the front page, half the class on the back page, and I will normally have their names written up here so that each student has a box in alphabetical order. But for these, I use those pages as a great way when students are doing presentations or if I'm conferencing with students and I end up writing a whole bunch of notes. So if I'm trying to keep track of the titles that students are writing for their monthly writing assessments or if I'm tracking um, information on, say, oral presentations or projects that I just need to kind of have a one-page place where I can kind of write all of my notes that I'm not writing on 30 different pages. So if I have 30 kids in my class and I'm copying notes down on 30 separate pages, that's quite overwhelming to me unless I have that much notes that I need to be recording. So I like to have a version of my class list that gives me that more flexibility to write larger notes. And I'm again, I'm often using those for things like oral presentations, um, conferencing with students, or even some small group work where I might have some detailed things that I need to write. Um, this is another great one to kind of quickly record notes on things like DRA, where you have next steps and strengths for students because you can kind of see that information at a glance and actually have some of the details that you might need as you're planning and assessing. So I also have group assessment pages. So there are many times in my class where I'm operating in small groups or students are grouped in partner activities or they're in group work and I need a way to record common data for every student in one group. So instead of writing it such as on this list where I would be writing the same thing for say five different students at a time because maybe they're all in one group, so I would write five different notes and I would just copy the same thing five different times. That's wasting a lot of my time, which I don't have. So then I will often consolidate them onto a class list like this. And these are my small group or group work notes tasks. And for these pages, I will often just write the student names. I'll kind of write them horizontally here. And I will write the student names here that are in the group. And then I will write the notes based on what I'm seeing in the group. So if there's one or two students, it might be a little bit different. But if the comments that I'm making are going to be common for most of the students in that particular group, then I will use this form. And I leave it blank. I don't ever fill these in permanently like I would on my other class lists where on my computer I will type their names in. But for here, I would have this are flexible. So when I'm photocopying these and keeping them at my desk, I will always have these blank because my groupings are constantly changing and even between subjects. So I might have, for language, it would be one group of students. But if it was for math, I could write a different group of students there. But I could use the same page to record all of these things. So I have that. And I have, again, two different variations if I need to write a little bit more or have more information. I try to give myself a variety of situations that I can um, use a variety of pencil and paper um, assessment options that if they're ready to go in in my classroom, it gives me a lot more flexibility to kind of grab a page that's already done, quickly take some notes, and then I have them with me. Now in terms of storage, I will use because this is a lot of loose papers and I really don't like loose papers. And I kind of have a two system, or I guess it's a three system, of what I'm using. So I will be collecting all of these notes and then I have a whole bunch of loose papers. But I need a place to put those loose papers. So I've used this book. I believe I got it at the dollar store, although I was at the dollar store a day or so ago and they didn't have these. So if you find one, pick them up. But I'm sure you can get them on Amazon. Um, Buffalo, I don't know. Anyways, um, you've got these books. Now I have different subjects down the side and they correspond with little pocket folders. Whoop. So we have little pockets that go with each subject. So I take all of those loose papers and I will pop them in here into the pocket folders. Now, I also will then take some of those pages, and sometimes this will be kind of where my formative assessment will stay, and then I will then transfer it into my formal plan book. So this is my plan book, and at the back of my plan book 
our assessment pages. So I have some assessment pages in the back there. And I will take all of my formative data. So at the end of a unit, I will take my formative data that I've collected. I will put it in here and I will have that staying in there. And if my binder starts getting full, I will then once the page is complete or say term one is over, I will take all of those pages out and I will put them kind of clipped and back in this folio thing. So I kind of have two pages that I flip back and forth. Loose papers go in here, more formal summative assessments stay in here because then I'm carrying this back and forth with me and I have both of those pieces with me at all times and I have different folders that I can fit in here. So I have like little folders as well where I will put different like rubrics or answer pages. I'm looking at this as my one from last year and I have rubrics and things like that all in here that I can keep and store. Now, those are my class lists. Now, the other thing that I will use too is I do use rubrics or check bricks. Now, a rubric is where you have, um, just so that we're all on the same page, I'm sure you've probably used a rubric before, but in case you haven't, a rubric is essentially a checklist of criteria that you are providing qualifiers for at the various levels of achievement. So you'll have a level one qualifier, level two qualifier, level three, level four, and four different specific expectations that you might be covering. So if you've got success criteria, then of students will write five sentences. And not that I think I would have that sentence, but just as an example, students will write five, a five sentence paragraph. And then you have the levels of how well they wrote their paragraph. And then when you're assessing that, you would check off what level they were on on that rubric. Now, a check brick is similar, in, except instead of having all four levels of achievement, you would have the standard level of achievement, which would be a level three if you're here in Ontario, where the provincial standard is. And then you would have space to write anecdotal notes and comments to reflect on whether or not a student was approaching or exceeding that standard. So if they're meeting that standard, then you would be good to go. And if they're extending on that standard, you could be writing comments about that. And if they're approaching, you could be using that space to give them feedback on how well or what they need to do next or what they could have added to bump that work up to, say, a level three or a B. So I will, I don't use rubrics all that often in my formative assessment. I'm much more likely to have a conversation with my students and say record notes right on their work and have that conversation because I find that that actually helps move the needle in terms of getting students to achieve more quicker is if I'm actually having a conversation and we're looking at their work. So my feedback with my students is going to be very much more a conference setting. However, rubrics and check bricks are a great tool to be able to communicate with parents how well a student is doing because they can see all of the expectations there in front of them. So most of the time when I'm using rubrics, I'm using them for summative assessments at the end of, say, a unit of study where I need to communicate an evaluation of student work. So I will use rubrics often at the end for projects. Now, I do often make sure that all of my rubrics align with the levels of achievement, of knowledge and understanding, thinking and planning, communication and application. So I do try to make sure that my rubric assessments are balanced between all four of those domains. And we're going to talk later on this month about how exactly I structure and mark a math test to make sure that all of those levels and domains are accomplished. And so we'll get more into how those levels of achievement come in, but I am definitely using rubrics to communicate that with students. Now, I will often use a check brick with my students if I, there is a task that we're doing frequently that I will be evaluating frequently. So things like math problem solving, the student's ability to solve a mathematical word problem, or as well as reading responses. It's something we are doing often in my classroom and we repeat it. And often the rubric or the checkbook that I would be using would be the same. Now, my favorite thing to do for these is to actually make it so that they fit on labels. 
and I will use Avery labels. Often I can get ones that are eight to 10 labels per page, so they're a little bit larger. And I can use Microsoft Word to quickly put the check brick of just what level three standards would be. And then I'm able to mark each student on the label. So I will have all of my students' names on the labels with the success criteria um, for level three on the label. And I will mark all of the students' work and I don't take the labels off yet. I will mark all of the students' work on the labels. Then I run those labels through the photocopier. I keep the paper, and then I will peel off each label and attach it to student work. And because all of my student work is organized in alignment with my class list, it's easy to just go one label, there's student number one, student number two gets the second label, student number three gets the third label. So it doesn't take me much very much time, but I'm able to mark everything on a rubric that's all sitting on one or two pages of labels, and then I can attach those rubrics right onto student work. So there's not a lot of extra photocopying and paper. So it does kind of save it for me. I try to reduce the amount of paper or even labels that I'm using, but I find that's very helpful to kind of keep everything together. I can quickly keep a copy of the rubrics and the rubrics can then be permanently attached to the student work so that they're not gonna be ripped off or fall off student work when they go home. So I will often use those. Bobby, literally the labels are so convenient and I can't say enough. Get your, don't buy them yourself though. Labels are often something schools are totally fine with buying especially if you tell them you're doing it to communicate assessment. Um, buy your office admin an extra large coffee and an extra treat and ask her if she can buy you some large labels for staples. And I bet you they probably even have some stashed away in the office. So it's definitely one of those things where you can use it and you don't probably have to buy it yourself. That could be something the school will buy with their discounted rate at office supply stores. So Highly recommend that as being a technique there. So those are my pace, paper and pencil. The other way you can assess is through digital tools. Now, I will be honest, I fluctuate every year back and forth between the level of how much pencil and paper I'm using versus how much digital tools I'm using. Digital tools do take a lot more time to set up they take a bit more management because you have to have your iPad with you. You can't just quickly grab a piece of paper and walk around with it. For some reason, I find that to be a little bit quicker and on the fly than even having a device um, that I need to kind of figure out how I'm going to add the information into the device. However, on the flip side, when it comes to reporting, having digital recording of grades is so much easier when it comes to report card time. So you're going to save yourself time with digital tools. At least I found this. I saved time when it came to writing my reports, but in the moment or kind of front loading and getting them all set up and prepped took a little bit more time. I found now that life is a little bit busier. I'm going back to more pencil and paper tasks and I do rely less heavily on digital tools. So I'm definitely not 100% digital tools. However, I do think there are three really great digital tools that are effective at being able to track a variety of student information and are really flexible for the needs of an actual elementary school teacher. So many digital tools are made for secondary teachers or teachers that aren't teaching a whack load of subjects like we are here in elementary. So if you're only teaching one or two subjects, there's a wealth of digital tools. However, if you are an elementary generalist teaching multiple, multiple subjects to the same class, there's a few more needs that you might have when you're looking at a digital tool that actually meets those needs. So the three I use are number one is Google Classroom. I am already using Google Classroom as a digital hand in bin and we're using Google Docs until they tear it away from me and tell me I cannot use it any longer. I'm still crossing my fingers that that doesn't happen. But for now, I have Google Classroom. Now, I do find marking and assessing on Google Classroom to be a time saver and to be really, really simple and easy. Having the ability to do all of my marking in my hand on a device is amazing. Not having to cart home buckets and bins of piles and piles of paper does save me time. 
Even if I only have about 50% of my students handing things in digitally while the other are handing it in pencil and paper, it still saves me a tremendous amount of time being able to mark that at least 50% of them on Google Classroom. Google Classroom also allows me to give anecdotal notes. It allows me to annotate their work in giving them a PDF version of my annotations, as well it allows me to record their mark right there on Google Classroom. It's not so easy for students to see that mark. It takes a little bit of work for them to actually see the mark that was published, but it's really easy for me. The second digital tool is Adocio. Now Adocio is a super flexible, a super flexible grade book that is available for teachers. And it's really, really handy to be able to use, especially if you are using an iOS device. I believe that there are only apps available for Apple. So if you have a Docio, it is essentially just a bunch of spreadsheets that you can use, except it's a bit more flexible than, say, using Microsoft Excel. And it allows you to record student videos, student photos, you can write comments, you can write marks, you can use a code to do your assessment. There's a lot of variety of ways that you can set up your markbook. One of the other things I really like about Adocio is that it talks and links to Google Classroom. So marks that I put on Google Classroom will automatically be imported into my Google, into my Adocio markbook, which is really handy. Now the downside to Adocio is that it's on one device and one device only. Now that's a huge limitation to me. I need things to be available on my phone, on my iPad at work, on my iPad at home, on my laptop. I need it across multiple devices and the ability to save things to a cloud, which Adocio really doesn't allow to be done. I would be all in in Adocio and probably use that 100% if it had that ability to kind of be able to use it on multiple devices really, really easily. The third digital tool is Markboard. Now this is PlanBoard's Markbook. So if you plan your lesson plans on PlanBoard, which is a digital planning tool, then using their Markbook software or Markboard software is also going to be a great tool. It's almost as flexible as Adocio. It's not quite as good in terms of all of the different functionalities and flexibility that Adocio has. However, you trade that for the ability on Markbook, you can, or Markboard, you can use it on your laptop, your IO, any iOS device, and it syncs with the cloud because it has a web-based and an app-based program. So it is available on all devices that you are signed in on which is quite helpful if you're someone like me that needs to kind of just be able to pick up the device closest to you to be able to add in information. So there are a variety of tools that you can use to collect and gather uh, Edocio. I It's a horribly spelled word because it's hard to remember, but I will link to it in the comments. But it starts with an I, I-D... E oh, I don't know. I will, I'll find it and I'll spell it. It's not an easy word, um, but it's definitely in the app store. There we go. Thanks, Kim. Yes, I believe that is it. Adocio. And I could be pronouncing that wrong too. And I apologize to the makers of Adocio if I'm butchering the name of your app. Um, so if you are using a variety of assessment tools, Nothing is going to be perfect. I myself am constantly on the journey of how to actually collect all of the information I need to collect. It is going to be something I'm probably going to have to work on for the rest of my entire career. These are the things that I have found to help me manage all of the things that are there. Having a variety of different assessment pages that I can grab for different situations that might arise in my classroom to be able to record the things I have to have one to two places that I can record those and put those papers so that they're all in one place, not just floating around randomly in my classroom, as well as being able to complement that with digital tools that allow me to do some of my assessment on the go and allow me to not have to cart home quite so much paperwork all the time definitely helps me to at least be comfortable with how assessment looks for myself. Is it perfect? No. Is it great? I think I'm getting there, but it's I'm happy enough 
with it as it is and I've kind of have to let go if it's not going to be a perfect assessment tool all of the time. It's kind of do what works and make the best of what you can do in the time that you have. So I hope that I've given you some different ideas about how you can collect different assessment data in your classroom and what kind of tools you can use to gather that information so that you are spending less of your own time on assessment because that's really the goal is to be able to spend less time so that you have some of your own personal time back in the evenings and on your weekends and during your prep time to do something else other than marking all day and night long. So thank you so much for joining me. We are going to be continuing for the rest of November to talk about different things off assessment. If you have any particular questions that you would like answered in one of these live videos on assessment, please feel free to reach out to me on any of the social media platforms through a private message or leaving a comment here on this video, letting me know what questions you might have about using assessment in your classroom. Thank you so much for joining me and we will see you next week. Bye for now.